My name is Jack Cunningham. I'm program coordinator at the Bill Graham Center for Contemporary International History. And uh, tonight's event uh, with Mark Lynch is part of a series that we uh, co-sponsor with the Canadian Arab Institute on uh, changing perspectives on the, uh, the uh, sorry, perspectives on a changing Middle East. And uh, now to introduce uh, tonight's speaker, Mark Lynch, I'm going to call on uh, Besma Mamani, who teaches uh, political science at the University of Waterloo and the Balsili School, and is a senior fellow of the Center for International Governance and Innovation. Besma. Welcome, everybody. Um, I have the pleasure of introducing Mark. Uh, Mark is a prolific writer, and many of you who've read his great works in the past are accustomed to some very interesting reading and hot off the presses outside, $35, no tax. I'm going to be your agent, uh, Mark. Uh, fantastic. I've already heard a little bit about the book. Can't wait to read it. Maybe not tonight, but very soon. Uh, the New Arab Wars, Anarchy and Uprising in the Middle East. Uh, this is among many of Mark's books, uh, well known to many of you, the Arab uprisings, uh, as well as Voices of the New Arab Public, Al Jazeera, Iraq, and Middle East politics today. We all know Mark as Professor of Political Science and International Affairs at George Washington University. He has also been a director of the Institute for Middle East Studies. He's the founder and director of Project on Middle East Political Science. I see a few students in the room. Really, if you're interested in Middle East politics, this is the resource for up-to-date information, not just from the academic world, the policy world, but really a great start. So I encourage you all to take a look at that website. He's also a non-resident senior associate at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, uh, contributing editor at the Monkey Cage blog, also where many political scientists showcase their great work uh, for the Washington Post and really uh, engage with some policy relevant information and, and resources and ideas. Uh, he's the co-director of Blogs and Bullets Project at USIP. Uh, as well, uh, Mark is uh, also well known for his time at foreign policy as not only a blogger and columnist, but really uh, fundamentally brought uh, to uh, so many of us the, the beginning of uh, the digital magazine um, uh, won the digital, digital Magazine Award finalist for his contributions and his uh, work behind the Middle East Channel, which really was always this great resource for us in, in academia. So with that, I welcome Mark Lynch to stage. All right. Thanks, Vesma, and uh, thanks to all of you uh, for coming out here uh, tonight. And um, that, so it really is exciting for me to be here. Um, I, I was explaining to, uh, to Besma uh, as we were coming here that um, so the, the book that's out there that I hope everybody buys at least 10 copies each of um, is actually uh, not published yet. Uh, it comes out on April 26th. So you guys are actually the first people in the entire world, um, except for my wife and my dog, uh, to, to have seen the book. So um, it's exciting for me to see it here, and I hope you all uh, find it interesting. So this is the second book that, uh, that I published with uh, the, the, the Press Public Affairs about the changes and the transformations of the Arab world uh, since uh, the eruption of the Tunisian uprising in late 2010. And the first one that, uh, that Basma mentioned um, uh, was called the Arab Uprising. And this was written in a fever uh, in kind of late, towards the end of 2011 and came out in very early in 2012. So this was at a very hopeful moment when it still seemed like everything was possible. And, and, and writing that book was in many ways not difficult, even though I was trying to range over multiple countries and trying to explain things that were happening in real time. But you, you know, you, when you're writing a book like that, you're carried along by excitement, enthusiasm, and hope. Every day I was you know, reaching out to my informants and my contacts and my friends and my colleagues over in the, over in the region, and they always wanted to talk. They couldn't, you couldn't shut them up about all the things that they were doing because they were driven by this real possibility of hope and change, which seemed very, very real. Um, writing this book was actually excruciating. It was an extremely difficult book to write because now, instead of telling a story of optimism and hope, it very much is a story of tragedy, failure, despair, and almost unspeakable horrors in many ways. Looking at the failed states, the civil wars in, uh, in Syria, Yemen, Libya, looking at the, the military coup in Egypt, looking at the, de the, the failed and destroyed hopes of so many millions of people, um, it just makes it very, very difficult uh, to, to 
wrap your head around what went wrong. And so that's what this book uh, began as, and, uh, and hopefully um, will help other people to, to understand, which is what went wrong, and, and how is it that the great hopes of January and February 2011, driven along by millions of people who were going out into the streets against, uh, un against unbelievable odds and seemed to be winning, um, how did it end up? like this? How did we end up uh, with these shattered states and failed hopes and, and, and all this frustration? And you know, so basically, you know, there's all kinds of, of aspects to this. Every country has its own story, and uh, there's lots of factors that are going to be idiosyncratic, unique to any particular case. But I think that the, the broader way of answering that question is, is twofold. Uh, the first is to say that I, I still believe, despite everything I see around me, I still believe that it's far too soon to say that the Arab uprisings failed because I think that's the wrong way to think about it. If you think about the Arab uprisings, as many of us did at the time, the Arab Spring, something which begins in January 2011 and then ends, then yes, it's unquestionably a failure. None of the aspirations, except to some extent in Tunisia, were realized. But if you think about it as a generation-long process, which began to challenge the foundations of a stagnant, corrupt, and autocratic system across, at a regional level that began, uh, depending on how you count, in the 1990s, 90s, certainly by the early 2000s, and you project that forward to the sort of thing that's going to take decades to resolve, then you can say that we are at a very grim chapter, but the book is far from over. And I really do believe that. It's hard for me to uh, maintain that hope sometimes, and certainly for many of my friends and colleagues in the region, it's even harder. But I think that taking a longer view is essential for understanding where we are in the Middle East right now. That relates to the second key part of the argument I want to put out there today, uh, and which is central to the book, which is that it's not just that the Arab uprisings died, it's that the regimes that they challenged killed them. And that fundamentally what we're seeing is the backlash against and the exploitation of that process of change, which, or that, that process of mobilization and protest, which did open up all kinds of new opportunities, but which states and regimes and autocrats and other non-liberal movements were just as capable of, of, of exploiting uh, as were those who were trying to bring about positive change. So what do I mean by that? So let me put it this way. When people saw the eruption of the Arab uprisings, and I don't know, you know, looking around the room, you know, I'm, I'm guessing that a lot of you who are here tonight uh, were paying attention to it back then. It's only five years ago, and it's, but it seems like a lifetime ago, certainly to me. But go back to January 2011, to February 2011, and this was a moment which was just genuinely exhilarating. This was a moment which was clearly uh, an unusual, a genuinely extraordinary moment in regional and I would say world politics. But what made it so extraordinary was not that you had a regime change in one or two countries. It was that it was clearly a, tr a genuinely transnational process. You saw these things unfold folding and happening. It wasn't just a Tunisian uprising. It wasn't just an Egyptian uprising. It was genuinely an Arab uprising with, with deep and profound links across almost every country in the region, inspiring people across very different political systems and direct and clear interactions between what was happening on the ground in those countries. So you would see at that time, back in you know, February 2011, early February, you would see Egyptians, Moroccans, um, uh, Tunisians, all the way over to Yemen, and they're, chant they're not just trying to do the same thing, they're chanting the exact same slogans. They're using the same protest techniques. They're talking to each other on Facebook and talking to each other on Twitter. They're learning from each other. They're watching each other on Al Jazeera. It was just clearly a transnational, region-wide movement, and in many ways, a, a global movement. But the key thing is that Nobody would look at the Arab uprising or the Arab Spring or whatever we're calling it and say this was a series of unconnected uh, national movements because it obviously was not. Um, behaviorally, you could see how it was happening. You could talk to the people and see what they said. Talk to Tawakal Karman in Yemen and she says, I was inspired by what I saw in Egypt, right? So you know that. Nobody would dispute it.
What, what people don't see quite as clearly is that the response was equally transnational and international. And that you, it was not simply a case of a series of threatened regimes responding individually to the, uh, the challenges that they were experiencing from below. There was a coordinated, sometimes competitive, sometimes, but very real process of regional and international responses to those uprisings, which unfolded differently depending on which place you're talking about. Now, the main exception to that is Tunisia and Egypt. And the reason Tunisia and Egypt are different is because they were first. They were fast. And they happened too quickly for the rest of the region to respond in any effective or coordinated fashion. So Tunisia, when the, the first place the uprising breaks out, this is, a, a, this is a country which is on the margins of the Arab world. It's not central to the political, cultural, military, strategic uh, concerns of the region. And this was largely seen at the time as a one-off, you know, something which is, you know, kind of, you could explain why Tunisia is different. And it didn't, and so it certainly generated excitement, but the regimes didn't necessarily feel threatened by it because many believe that what happens in Tunis will stay in Tunis. But then, and, and by the way, that, that only took a couple of weeks in Tunisia, and nobody really expected Ben Ali was going to fall until he was literally on an airplane. And people couldn't believe that any Arab leader would actually leave voluntarily, because Arab leaders don't do that. They hold on, and they fight to the end, and they will die rather than leave their thrones. This is, yeah, <laughs> they, they, um, yeah, right, right. But no, but from their perspective, he was stupid because that's the one thing you never do is you never give up. He was a traitor to the cause of Arab dictatorship. Um, he set a really bad example by leaving peacefully um, from their point of view. Um, the Egyptian revolution only took 18 days. It happened extremely quickly once again, and it ended with Hosni Mubarak leaving. When Hosni Mubarak was overthrown, and I don't have time to go through all the details of it, I'm happy to later, when Mubarak is, is removed from power by the army, this set in motion what I would consider a virtually existential shock to the leaders and the elites of the region, comparable to what you saw back in 1979 when the Shah of Iran was overthrown. Not because Islamists came to power, but because one of the anchors and pillars of regional order with strong American backing, a powerful military, and a long proven track record of staying in power at any cost was overthrown. And if he could go, from the perspective of every other leader in the region, anybody could go. This triggered existential fears everywhere, whether you're talking about the kings and the emirs of the Gulf, whether you're talking about the dictators of uh, you know, someone like Bashar al-Assad in Syria, whether you're talking about Gaddafi, whether you're talking about kings, presidents, doesn't matter. They all suddenly felt vulnerable, really for the first time in quite a long time. And the response to that, I think, is, helps to explain much of what we see in the ensuing year, months and years which followed. They, a combination of sometimes an orderly and effective response, at other times a panicked and ineffective response, but very much driven by this existential fear which was caused not by the rise of Iranian power, not even by the rise of Islamists, or, but by the idea that they could actually be overthrown and that their, the, the United States, which was their ace in the hole, their protector, couldn't or wouldn't save them. I heard this again and again and again in those early days after Mubarak went down. You would hear people saying, Mubarak was America's oldest friend in the region and they discarded him like a used Kleenex, right? And if they would discard him and people started protesting in Riyadh, wouldn't they also abandon the Saudi royal family? Wouldn't they also abandon the Kuwaiti emir? Who wouldn't they abandon if they would abandon Mubarak? Now, I would take issue with the idea that they actually abandoned Mubarak. I don't think there's anything America could have done to save Mubarak, even if they wanted to. But I'm talking about the perception, what people took, took away from it and how they responded. So how do they respond? I would say this plays out at four different levels. And each of those four levels has its own logic. The first level is self-preservation. Those countries, primarily Gulf countries, which had the resources to do so, 
work extremely quickly and for the most part effectively to make sure that they themselves would stay in power. So the Qatar, the United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia, they had the wealth, the resources, the state capacity, and the international backing and protection to do whatever was necessary to keep themselves in power pretty much on their own. So if you're Saudi Arabia, you can declare, for example, you know, $100 billion in public spending, raising everybody's salaries, giving them a huge bonus, and if anybody bothers or dares to show up in a public square to protest, you arrest them, throw them in prison, and no one in the international community will say a word. And that works for Qatar, the UAE, and uh, Saudi Arabia. Nobody else really has the capacity to do that, but those three were able to do that. They secured their home front very quickly. The next stage then was securing the alliance system. And going back long predating the Arab uprising, there was a Saudi-led regional order in which a very significant number of states in the region were part of an informal but very clear alliance system. One might have called this the American-led alliance system, but for our purposes we'll call it the Saudi-led alliance system because that's how it unfolded in the days that followed. In this alliance system, the Saudis, the UAE, and Qatar, largely working together at this level, um, worked to preserve and protect their own allies and to, make to insulate them from the pressure. I call this the insulation level. And basically, it's just make sure that none of your friends are overthrown. So for the less wealthy states of the Gulf, like Kuwait and Oman, um, there, was, there was financial incentives, basically give them extra money so that they can use this to buy off support and help them weather the crisis. Um, for countries like Morocco and for Jordan, you have a combination of financial assistance, media and political assistance, um, and a whole set of things designed to help them weather the storm. The Moroccan constitutional reforms were uh, part of this, uh, Jordanian shuffling of their government, but a lot of this is greased by Gulf money, which gives these otherwise poor countries the wherewithal to then navigate, survive, and then deal with the consequences later. Where none of that sufficed, uh, probably the single most important country is Bahrain. Uh, in Bahrain, there were simply too many people in the streets. Uh, by many counts, um, at the height of the Bahraini protest movement, more than half of the citizen population of the country was in the streets protesting. You can't buy those people off. Um, it's too much, too strong. There, it required direct military intervention. Saudi Arabia and Qatar sent GCC troops across the causeway, uh, supported the Bahraini military and police in cracking down, and carried out a massive campaign of sectarian repression, violence, torture, um, a whole set of things designed to defeat, and this is actually the first of the Arab uprisings, defeated by force. Uh, and and they, they, they won in the short term, and they crushed this by force and secured the Gulf as a defensive perimeter against change. Um, and that's the, that's the second level, defensive perimeter. This was largely secured, I would say, by the end of March, early April of 2011. Um, then you get to the next two phases, the ones that my book really focuses on, and that's um, the, basically the category of countries that underwent transitions, where there was genuine change and where there were openings. And here, the logic changed, because instead of unified action to protect allies, you got instead competition between those same three states to try and dictate the outcomes of a transitional process. And you saw fierce and intense competition um, instead of a unified purpose. And this, I think, is what helps to explain the course that events took in Egypt, in Tunisia, in Yemen, in Libya, and in Syria. And those are the countries on which I'm going to focus most of my comments for the, for, for the rest of the evening. So let me divide those, let me subdivide once again. I said four. Um, the third level are those countries where the state held together, institutions held together, and warfare primarily took the form, or proxy war primarily took the form of political warfare. This is Egypt and Tunisia for the most part. I, I, you could argue that Libya and Yemen started out that way, but they didn't end, it didn't stay that way for long. In Egypt and Tunisia, you saw an intense competition break out almost immediately following the removal of the leaders, um, where each, and, and here it's primarily Qatar and the UAE, the Saudis are there of course, but we're going to focus on Qatar and the Emirates, 
um, to support their own networks of, of political allies to try and bring them to power. In each case, it's largely the same set of actors who are in play. Uh, for Qatar, it was, a, it was a combination of Islamists, the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, the Anahta movement in Tunisia, along with a cadre of activists who had been nurtured by, uh, by Al Jazeera, uh, the, the, the pan-Arab television station hosted by Qatar, and these networks of activists who had been within the Qatari orbit for quite some time. None of these uh, groups necessarily saw themselves as Qatari clients. I'm not saying that Qatar created this. I'm saying that they became the instrument by which Qatar saw the opportunity to advance its interests. For the UAE and Saudi Arabia, this included the enemies of the activists and the Islamists, big businessmen, uh, religious minorities, um, the state, uh, the army especially, but also the security ministries, um, you know, kind of high capital. Those became the networks through which the UAE and Saudi Arabia would work to try and restore the old order. And much of what you saw over the course of, um, of 2011 to 2013 was the playing out of incredibly intense domestic politics which were being shaped and intensified by these external interventions. Again, I want to be really clear, I'm not saying that what happens in Egypt and Tunisia is purely a function of this Gulf uh, meddling. Um, I'm saying that the Gulf meddling helped to intensify, to accelerate, and to worsen those domestic conflicts. It made the Islamists and their rivals less willing to compromise, more fearful of each other, and gave them the resources that they needed in order to carry out their competition at the highest levels. Now, most people look at Egypt and Tunisia and they would say, yes, but those, but those two cases ended differently. And they did. And they ended very dramatically differently. Uh, Tunisia managed to complete a successful transition to democracy, um, which would be the envy of any of the Eastern Central European cases which make up, or the, the Southern European or Latin American cases, which make up the body of transitions to democracy, political science literature. Um, they, they succeeded. Egypt failed. Uh, the transition ended in a military coup, bloody repression, and the reintroduction of a particularly uh, violent uh, and quite nasty uh, military regime. So in that sense, the outcomes are different. But in another sense, they're not. And what I mean by that is that you saw a very similar process unfold of intense polarization between the Islamists and their enemies, the near collapse of the political system, and then, in the end, the victory of the UAE-Saudi coalition over the Qatari coalition. In Egypt, the Muslim Brotherhood won the presidency and then was overthrown and replaced by a military, uh, uh, by a military general with the explicit and extremely lucrative, at this point, uh, the latest estimates say about $40 billion worth of financial support from um, uh, United, Arab, United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia, and uh, Kuwait. Um, that's a lot of money. Um, and that was at the expense of the Qatari coalition. In Tunisia, the, uh, the, the, uh, the Qatari-backed coalition of, uh, of Al-Nehta voluntarily decided to step down to avoid the Egyptian fate. And, they, and instead of fighting this out to the end, they compromised. A really quite remarkable decision, which is um, worthy of all kinds of study. Rashid Ghanoushi and the Anahta party decided to step down rather than fight. They basically allowed, uh, they handed over power to a technocratic government and then allowed themselves or were beaten, depending on how you want to count, um, in the next elections and allowed a peaceful transition of power through elections to uh, the Nida Tunis movement. The outcome, though, was once again, the UAE-Saudi-backed coalition ended up in power Power and the Qatar-backed coalition lost. Um, at the e right around the end of this, the summer of 2013, the Qatari emir himself um, abdicated, his, abdicated his throne and was replaced by his son. And the architect of Qatari foreign policy, Hamid bin Jassim, was stripped of all of his positions, stripped of his power, and uh, last we all heard is vacationing on the Riviera. And the point of this is simply to say that there was a proxy war waged in political terms in the two major transitional countries between a UAE-Saudi coalition and a Qatari coalition, and the Qatari coalition lost. And that is the common thread in Egypt and Tunisia. Now, 
In the countries where the state did not survive, however, is where things really get quite, uh, quite uh, unpleasant and nasty. Um, and those are the countries where the state collapsed, failed, and ended up in each case in violent, bloody, and at this point seemingly irresolvable civil wars. Let me take them one at a time. Here, of course, I'm talking about Libya, Yemen, and Syria. Um, I'm going to take those in turn. First, I'll start with Yemen. Uh, Yemen was one of, you know, everybody ignores Yemen. I don't know why everybody ignores Yemen. Yemen is an extremely important and extremely interesting country, but it never quite gets the attention that it deserves. <laughs> Yemen has uh, extremely low levels of, uh, of internet penetration, literacy. Uh, it's an extremely poor country relative to much of the rest of the region. It also had one of the most robust, innovative, and effective protest movements of the entire Arab Spring. It's, it's exceptional what the, what the uh, protesters of Yemen managed to accomplish. Um, and I think it was entirely appropriate at the time that Tawakko Karman, one of the leaders of those protests, uh, was, uh, was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for her efforts. Um, Yemen managed to sustain this, um, this mobilization against tremendous odds, trying to overthrow the long ruling President Ali Abdullah Saleh. Um, but it proved to be extraordinarily difficult. At the time of the defensive perimeter that I was describing, um, what happens is that the, the Yemeni military opens fire on a group of protesters. It starts turning bloody. The military splits, and that split occurs along very clear Qatar versus non-Qatar lines, um, and you end up with an armed showdown between externally backed you know, halves of the military, which then continues for many, many months. Ali Abdullah Saleh himself um, has been a longtime Saudi ally and proxy. Um, he's, he was basically Riyadh's man in Sana'a. And um, he was coming under greater and greater pressure to step down, to leave, but he wouldn't leave. And it turned out that the, uh, the client was a little more powerful than, than the master um, at this game of Yemeni politics. And there was this long, destructive stalemate that went on for months. At one point, a big bomb goes off. Ali Abdullah Saleh is badly injured. He's medevaced out to Riyadh, and he's in a military hospital there. And he still won't step down from power. Um, and he stays on until, fatefully, the GCC manages to broker a transition plan in which Ali Abdullah Saleh would step down from power, but was given immunity from political prosecution and allowed to remain as the head of his political party. That was a fateful decision, which the activists were deeply opposed to at the time, and they were prescient as to why. You then saw a managed transition to Saleh's vice president, who seemed to be a faithful, um, a kind of a faithful vehicle for Saudi interests in Yemen. And then a UN-led national dialogue, which was meant to bring on board all of the various grievances from the South, from the North, from the youth, from the youth, all of this, which was supposed to go over uh, you know, a defined period and then lead to the drafting of a new constitution and then meaningful elections. And this actually went forward. Uh, Jamal Ben Omar, the veteran Algerian diplomat, did a, actually a very good job for a lot of this time trying to bring this through, but ultimately it failed. And it failed because the national dialogue was unable able to bridge the really profound differences between all these different highly divided parts of the Yemeni polity. Um, the failure of Yemen is, comes to a head when the national dialogue is close to conclusion. Um, it's about to be announced uh, a new version of federalism, which is going to, in the minds of the Houthi movement up north, going to you know, pretty profoundly affect their vital interests as they define them. So they launch a preemptive strike. They seize the capital city of Sana'a. Um, they put the, the president under house arrest, from which he miraculously escapes. Um, he then is smuggled down to Aden, down in the south. The Houthis, they're from the north. I mean, north of, north of Yemen and south of Yemen. I mean, these are totally different places. But the Houthis decide to pursue him down there. A really terrible decision on their part. Um, once there, you then get in March of last year, the Saudi decision to intervene uh, directly with uh, a military campaign aimed at uh, driving the Houthis out, 
of Sana'a and restoring Hadi to power. They've now been bombing Yemen mercilessly for the over a year now, causing unbelievable levels of humanitarian suffering. Yemen was already a very poor country. S under a year of intensive bombing, you've seen basically the near collapse of the healthcare system, sanitation, water. Uh, there's near famine conditions over much of the country. There's millions of displaced. And they're nowhere close to a political resolution, a military victory. And it just kind of goes on and on and on. I I've understood in my last two days in Canada that this is quite controversial here. Um, it should be. I, I think it should be controversial, the provision of advanced weaponry to, um, to Saudi Arabia for this campaign. It's controversial in the United States, too. Um, and uh, there's actually legislation being introduced in Congress as well um, about the, uh, the legality of uh, selling arms to Saudi Arabia uh, over, over the, the, the events in Yemen. But so in Yemen, this is a proxy war between Saudi Arabia and Iran. Um, for the most part, but also between Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates. Because part of what's going on right now is you have Saudi, Qatar, and the UAE all on different sides, each backing their own local forces and their own local actors. And this helps to contribute to the mess that you see in Yemen. One of the most interesting pieces of news we've seen out of Yemen in quite some time happened last week when uh, President Hadi decided to fire his uh, vice president. Um, or he did. I don't know if he decided it, but he did. Um, he removed his vice president, who um, is a very well-respected figure who is widely seen as the UAE's man in this government, and replaced him with General, General uh, Ali, uh, Ali Mohsen, who is wi a very controversial military figure who's widely viewed as Qatar's man in Yemen, which means that you now have not just a Saudi-Yemeni proxy war, but also an emirati Qatari proxy war with Saudi in the middle and Yemen an absolute mess. And that's just one example, perhaps a peripheral one to some people, but for me quite central example of how badly things have gone wrong due to external meddling and warfare. But that then brings us to Libya and to Syria. And Libya and Syria are the two cases where, and I'm going to go over Libya rather quickly so I can spend enough time on Syria because that really is the epicenter of much of the human tragedy of the Middle East over the last five years. But Libya, I think, is very important in getting us to Syria. In Libya, as in Syria, um, you have a genuine Arab Spring uprising. It's the exact same thing you see in most of the other countries. Uh, you know, this uh, diverse coalition, youth coalition, using the same slogans, the same, uh, you know, using their camera phones for YouTube videos, hashtagging the revolution, all those things are the same. Um, but what was different was that in Libya, unlike any other country up to that point, there was an immediate violent response. And Gaddafi, unlike uh, bin Ali, unlike Hosni Mubarak, unlike anybody else up till that point, responded with uh, brutal military force. And very, very quickly, uh, Libya went from a peaceful uprising to an armed civil war. Large amounts of territory very quickly fell to the rebels. Gaddafi regrouped his superior military force, allowed him to recapture territory quickly. He was advancing on Benghazi which was the capital of the rebellion and um, was advancing with the stated intent of butchering everybody there, hunting people down in the alleyways and murdering them um, like rats. I mean, this was the part that many of you probably remember about uh, the run up to the UN uh, Security Council discussion of authorizing a military intervention. Um, which, in fact, happens. The uh, UN Security Council authorizes a humanitarian military intervention. NATO begins bombing, and it, this ends quickly uh, Gaddafi's advance on Benghazi, and then everything, and then it stalls. And then you see a rather rapid, and for some people at least, uh, unexpected transition from a humanitarian intervention aimed at protecting Benghazi to an offensive campaign in which NATO becomes the air force of the rebels, seeking regime change and, and the overthrow of the Gaddafi regime. This drags on for six long months before Gaddafi is finally overthrown. Um, okay, so that's a story which is probably familiar to most of you. Um, there's other parts of it that are extremely important to me, though, as I try and piece together, because I was actually a supporter of that war at the time. I thought that the cost of the slaughter of 
of the protesters and of the civilians in Benghazi was a price that simply couldn't be paid, especially with full knowledge and forewarning of what was about to happen. And I think that still I might well be the case. I've changed my mind about that war, but I, uh, but I understand and I believe that my reasoning at the time was right in the sense of seeing this slaughter unfolding in front of us and doing nothing to prevent it would have been unacceptable. But that intervention carried with it a number of costs which weren't obvious at the time, at least to many people. One was that the Gulf support, Arab support for that, in, for that campaign um, was, came at the explicit cost of not saying anything about the uh, crackdown in Bahrain. Um, this was a very explicit quid pro quo. Uh, the Arab League and the GCC would support the intervention in Libya. You don't do anything about Bahrain. And that's one part of it. It facilitated that crackdown elsewhere. But it also did something more. It militarized the conflict and changed it from something which was instead of being about a peaceful civil uprising against a despot became an international military intervention with all that that entails. It went from uprising to war. And whether that was a just war or not is largely besides the point because a war is what it became and with all kinds of, of very clear consequences in what follows. The way the war was fought matters as well. The United States made it very clear from the start, um, and again, very wisely in my view, that it would not introduce its own forces, which meant that the battle had to be fought by Libyans on the ground receiving indirect support and air support from the coalition. What that meant was that it was the local militias on the ground doing the actual fighting, which were assembled into a ragtag, loosely organized army with a you know, kind of thrown together political leadership. But what ends up happening is that those militias each have their own external sponsors. The UAE had their group of rebels, Qatar had their group of rebels, and they were fighting each other often almost as much as they were fighting Gaddafi. Uh, there were times when arms shipments that were sent in from Qatar to their militia would be, the convoy would be hijacked by the Emirati militias and the weapons would be seized. Uh, there would be all kinds of competitive struggles to control territory, to control networks, all of this, what it did was entrenched divisions which, after the fall of Gaddafi, became fatal to the Libyan transition. So one of the myths about Libya, I think, is that there was this unified movement which overthrew Gaddafi with international support, which then somehow mysteriously turned into the entrenchment of warlords and militias and failure. And what I'm trying to argue, what I'm saying here, is that that was built into the nature of the intervention itself. Those militias became powerful and well-armed and entrenched at the local level because of the way they were used in the war to overthrow Gaddafi. And Libya today, for those who don't follow it as closely as they might, is now divided between three different competing governments, each claiming legitimacy, each of them backed by powerful fighting forces, and the complete absence of a functional state which is capable of enforcing uh, any kind of, uh, of effective sovereignty over the country. Um, over the course of time, you get active, direct UAE and Egyptian military intervention, bombing, you've got civil war, it's just a mess. Um, and that's not even getting into the disastrous effects of the attack on the American consulate in Benghazi, uh, which turned Benghazi into uh, the political partisan football in the United States, maybe not so much in Canada, but in the United States, basically Libya has been defined by the tragedy in Benghazi in 2012. Okay, so that's Libya. Libya also did something else. I think Libya dramatically reshaped the politics and the, and, and the course of the uprising in Syria. Syria, like Libya, like all of the others, was very much part of the overall Arab uprising. In January, February 2011, you had, again, these unbelievably courageous Syrian activists going out in the streets, organizing protests, um, putting them up on YouTube, doing all the same things you saw every place else. If you ask them, if you talk to them, they saw themselves as part of the broader Arab uprising, the broader Arab Spring, and they were trying to do the same sorts of things. They didn't have a great deal of success in the first couple of months because Syria is an extremely repressive and brutal police state in which protesting is difficult, dangerous, and fiercely repressed. Um, and that's what was, so they weren't getting much traction up until the mid-March 
uh, mid-March of 2011. The traction began almost immediately, the day after NATO bombing began of Libya. Um, and I don't think that that's an accident. I think that this intervention, one of its effects, was to change the thinking of both protesters and of the Assad regime about how to deal with protests. On the, on, for the, on the point of view of the protesters, this was inspirational in exactly the way that many people hoped it would be. NATO jets flying in support of protesters against a brutal dictator willing to use force might have an inhibiting effect on Assad's willingness to use force. If he does use force against us, the world will come to protect us, just like they did the Libyans. It emboldened people to take risks they wouldn't have taken before. And again, that could be both a good thing or, in the event, a bad thing. Um, on Assad's side, it showed him the need to strike a balance between two obvious failed strategies. Um, ben Ali and Mubarak were obvious failures. They didn't use force and they were overthrown. You don't want to do that. Gaddafi showed another failure. He used too much force too quickly. And, and that attracted international intervention. You don't want to do that. Instead, you want to modulate your violence, use enough to keep the rebellion from growing, but not enough to get a UN Security Council resolution and get NATO jets coming and flying in. And you saw a very clear modulation of violence um, in the period leading up to this. March 17th, uh, March 16th, 17th is the, the famous events in Dara in the, south of, in the south of Syria where the kind of you get the first crossing of the line, the brutalization of several kids who had been um, scrawling anti-Assad graffiti by uh, perhaps an over-enthusiastic police captain, um, leading to a rapidly spiraling and escalating um, uh, round of protests which were met by increasingly brutal force. And what you see for a period of about four to five months is this dance between an opposition which is remaining nonviolent, it is not taking up arms, and Assad is using more and more force, more and more violence. You, this is the time when you're seeing brutal attacks in Hama and Homs. This is when you're beginning to see you know, the, the spread of extreme violence and culminating in many ways with uh, President Obama's declaration that Assad has lost his legitimacy and can no longer, rule, and, and can no longer stay in power. Uh, whether he actually meant that he was going to overthrow Assad or not um, isn't really the point. I don't think he did, but it was taken as such by people around the region, by the opposition, by Assad, and by regional allies. You then enter the next phase where there was this intense and extremely important debate, largely lost to history, but I try and recapture in the book, within the Syrian opposition over whether or not to take up arms. And this was an extremely important debate. One faction, which was heavily dominated by the local coordination councils, activists on the ground, were steadfastly against taking up arms. They believed that taking up arms would lead to catastrophe. It would lead, the militarization of the revolution would lead to an unwinnable war you know, and escalation and horrors and would sacrifice the soul of the revolution. The pro-arming faction, which included a lot of the activists on the outside um, and also the nascent Free Syrian Army made up of uh, military defectors, argued that you had to militarize because Assad doesn't understand anything but the logic of force, nonviolence isn't working, people are being massacred, something has to be done. This debate split and divided Syrian opposition institutions, regional politics, international politics for half a year. Um, at first, Qatar, and especially Qatar, decided to bridge that gap by focusing at the United Nations on trying to build support, Libya style, for an international intervention. They failed when Russia and China vetoed uh, the resolution at the Security Council, at which point in February of 2012, I think the gates of arming and militarization opened up and you ended up with a very rapid escalation of violence on both sides. Arms began to pour in. Uh, this was about half a year before the United States started having a serious debate about whether or not to arm the rebels. Um, but by that point, the Saudis, the Qataris, and the Turks had already begun to pour significant amounts of weaponry into their preferred factions. But they did it again, as in Libya, in a totally uncoordinated way, in a highly destructive way. They funded the guys that they liked. Some, you know, the Turks might go through the Islamists, um, the Saudis might go through the tribes, um, you know, you can go, I can go through the list if you like, but the point is that it wasn't coordinated in any meaningful way or attached to a political strategy, 
It was highly localized, and you ended up with a rapid escalation. Now, those of us who follow Syria closely might think that there have been these dramatic reversals in course and dramatic turning points in the war that followed. I tend to be of the opinion that actually very little has changed um, since uh, the summer of 2012, and even before then, in the sense that basically what you've had is a strategic stalemate um, right from that period. Where, and what I mean by a strategic stalemate is that the rebels couldn't win, but they couldn't lose. Assad couldn't win, but he couldn't lose. And the reason that for that was that each was able to draw an external backing, which at the point of their seemingly imminent defeat, um, you would see someone, you'd see their external backers step in, increase their support to make sure that they couldn't lose. People forget that in the summer of 2012, Assad was about to fall. Um, his uh, bomb took out and killed his entire security cabinet. The rebels were advancing on Damascus, and everybody was certain that Assad was about to fall. Hezbollah stepped in and came to his rescue. Then the rebels seemed to be about to lose. More money and guns start pouring into the opposition. Then the rebels use their new weaponry, and they begin advancing again. Iran intervenes directly. More weapons, different kinds of weapons pour into the opposition, and they begin advancing again. Russia intervenes directly. And in each case, you're not getting victory, you're getting maintaining the strategic stalemate. But that stalemate comes at ever greater costs. The human costs of this are simply staggering. By the time you get a few years into this war, um, by most estimates, something like half the population of Syria, 12, 13, 14 million people are refugees or displaced from their homes. Millions of people are dead. Entire cities are reduced to rubble. Um, you have the emergence, not just in Syria, but across the region of the worst kinds of sectarianism, sectarian hatreds, uh, jihadism, radicalism on both sides, and basically Syria becoming the battlefield where all of these horrible things are being produced. The Islamic State, ISIS, which I'm happy to answer questions about if you like, but I'm not going to dwell on here, emerges out of this cauldron, um, out of the shattered, failed state and the, and, and the war, which then creates the opportunities for the emergence of of such a faction. And that is, you know, kind of brings together almost all of the major trends and, um, and pathologies of the post-Arab Spring. Okay, so traditionally, this would be the point where I now transition and I leave you with hope because nobody likes a downer and nobody likes to be told that everything is hopeless. Um, it's very difficult for me to do that because frankly everything is horrible and, and, it, and it is fairly hopeless. Um, there are some signs of hope and I, what, I, what I will finish with is just saying a few words about some things that might at least allow us to put this into a perspective where we might begin to hope. The first is go back to the, where I began, looking at this as a generational uh, process rather than a short-term one. And you could say that if you look at the broad changes in Arab societies, if you look at the demographics and the rise of these youth who simply have much greater competencies, different expectations, and the ability to do something about their frustrations and their fears, you, you, it's very difficult not to have hope when you meet, you know, the you know young Arabs. I mean, to me, everyone is young now, but um, but I mean, you see people in their 20s, 30s, um, and just see what they can do, how smart and cosmopolitan and educated and powerful they are. It's just that alone. Even if I can't give you a story about how they eventually win, it's hard for me to believe that they don't, simply because of how different they are from the generations that came before. That adds on to the fact that right now, Arab regimes clearly believe that they're back in control. They believe that they have won. If you talk to, you go to the, like a, 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 a big international forum in the Gulf, what you'll hear is self-confidence, that we have, we, we've gotten past the difficult times, we're back in control, everything is back to normal. Everybody wants everything to be back to normal. And it's not, it's not even close. None of these regimes have even come close to beginning to solve the problems which caused the Arab uprisings in the first place. And in most cases, those underlying drivers are significantly worse than they were in 2010. Significantly worse. And I mean that at every level. Economic, opportunities, corruption, state services, public order, um, safety, you name it. Um, things are worse rather than better. 
And that's a combination which suggests that another wave of popular mobilization is very likely uh, to hit. I don't know exactly when, I don't know exactly where, but it seems extraordinarily likely, especially with the price of oil bottoming out and none of these regimes having the kinds of resources that were available to them in 2011 to do the insulation and the self-preservation that I was just describing. To put it really bluntly, you can do things at $140 a barrel oil that you can't do at $40 a barrel oil. And the Gulf states which financed and funded the counter-revolution um, were flush in 2011. And now they're seeing their credit ratings downgraded. They're borrowing hundreds of billions of dollars on international financial markets to cover their debts. And they're looking into a ways to slash government spending, which tend to be the sort of things that anger people rather than co-opt them. So that's number two. Um, the generational change is still happening and the ability of these regimes to withstand it is going down. And, and this, isn't just, this isn't just notional. One of the best examples of this for me, um, you know, a lot of people will say to me, and is, you know, aren't people sick of protesting? Aren't people afraid to protest? They saw how horrible everything was. Why would they ever do it again? And I keep saying, look at Egypt right now. When Egypt's military coup happened in 2013, it was rapturously welcomed across the political society. Um, it was supported by not just the old elites, but by a wide range of activists and so-called liberals. And General Sisi was basking in popular acclaim. If you look at Egypt today, just two years later, three, two and a half years later, um, it looks entirely different. CC has failed to improve the economy despite getting some $40 billion in support from the Gulf. Things, everything's worse. He's failed to restore public order. There's a spiraling insurgency in the cities. And there's now open elite dissent, criticism in the media, and clear signs of infighting within the regime between institutions, leading to something that looks, to my eye, rather more dangerous politically than, say, 2010, when Mubarak suddenly, despite not realizing it, was on his last legs. And so I could go on, but I think I'm, I'm going to wrap this up and simply say that the Arab uprisings were a moment in which everything seemed possible. Turns out that change could produce things that were a lot worse than people expected, and things could fail, things could go horribly wrong, but that doesn't mean that change stops. It doesn't mean that uh, the history has ended, and I think we're still only part way through a story which doesn't necessarily have a happy ending. I can't promise you a happy ending, and in fact, the odds are probably against it, but I don't think that where we are right now is where we're gonna be in two years, five years, and certainly not in 10. Okay, let me stop there, and I'm happy to answer questions about anything, including all the things I didn't talk about, like Iran and ISIS and anything else. Okay, thanks. So, Judging, judging by the fact that I'm wearing a microphone and there's microphones here, I'm assuming that people who want to ask questions probably should talk into the microphone since they're recording this. So why don't you come on down and um, we'll start here and go to here. Oh, go ahead. First of all, you express yourself extremely well. There's so much to say, but my comment or question is, in terms of the head of state, in terms of his, not too much of a her, fiduciary responsibility. Mm -hmm. And when you think of Assad and what is coming out now in terms of the, of the criminality that may exceed what uh, mm -hmm. post, post Nuremberg, but the roilings that go on that you attenuate so very, very well, there is very little opportunity for optimism. But the question I pose, in a sense, in terms of what I call normative, in terms of just natural, in terms of just cogent, in terms of a head of state yeah. a fiduciary obligation in terms of an entrenched statute that they need to become aware or are they so much of afraid that they will use the gun and then live in fear until the end as I may have said early on perhaps the president of Tunisia was the most intelligent that he evacuated in a sense with a relative degree of comfort whereas the others atavistically are entrenched that I will stay in until I'm dead or with Gaddafi pleading at the edge of a pipe before yeah. they shot him, before they humiliated him. 
So I, I think the short answer to that question is the latter, that I think most of them will fight to the death and um, at the expense of their people, at the expense of everything else. I mean, I think that that seems to be the only, you know, forget ideology, forget norms and everything else. The only thing these leaders really seem to believe in is their own survival and power at any cost. But I want to actually answer your question in slightly different terms. So I like the way you framed it in terms of responsibility. A lot of people will say the Arab uprisings were a myth because the people don't really believe in democracy. It wasn't really about democracy. And we can have an argument about that, but I'm willing to accept that that's right. But there are some, I'm willing to accept, I don't believe it, but I'm willing to accept it. But there are some core things that were common across the protest movements, which I think are, that your question directly raises. So for example, social justice was a major demand of every single protest movement, and that focuses on the disappearance of the middle class, the breaking of this ruling bargain, of the provision of social welfare in exchange for, you know, of, you know well, well, you can be a dictator as long as you take care of us, breaking of that bargain. One of the great things that emerges on the scene in the mid-2000s in the Arab world is the, 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 with the rise of social media and Al Jazeera is a lot of this corruption and inequality is made visible in ways that it never was before. So some of like the iconic moments here are when Bahraini activists use Google Earth to show exactly how much of the island had been appropriated by the royal family for their own personal use. Um, something very similar was done in Tunisia, uh, showing, and then the WikiLeaks um, helped to uh, put, you know, provided details of the corruption and exploitation of wealth by Ben Ali's family. So things like that. Um, you know, social justice, corruption, transparency, um, all of those things were at the core of what people were demanding. And importantly, you don't need to be demanding democracy to be, to be demanding rep recompense for that. And I, so I think that that's a, an, a, I think it's a useful and good way to think about the nature of their demands and how they might, and how they might be redressed. Hmm. Over here. Thanks, uh, Mark. Uh, the, many in the West seem to believe that uh, the Saudis are their allies in the fight against ISIS. I have not seen any evidence of that, in fact, with the country. And the other question is, do the Qataris really know what the hell they're doing? Or is there, is there a, a logic behind their mad, apparent madness? Thank you. Well, the Qataris, I think, have changed. Um, you know, so I think that Qatar, up until 2013, had been pursuing a very interesting strategy of basically trying to fight with Saudi Arabia. Basically, whatever Saudi Arabia did, Qatar tried to do the opposite. Um, but they also, using Al Jazeera and, uh, and, and what Al Jazeera became, they seem to be positioning themselves as kind of the voice of the activist community, the voice of uh, not just the Muslim Brotherhood, although that was part of it, but trying to position themselves as, as the future, as the bridge. Um, and I think that failed spectacularly by the time you get to 2013, and they've backed off of that quite a bit. Um, do they know what they're doing? And does anybody know what they're doing? Um, they, they seem to know what they were doing, but they didn't do it very well. If, especially, I, I, mean, I, I suspect you're talking here about Syria more than anything else. I think there's a common theme in the way the external groups approached the, the Syrian factions, and it tended to be working through the most convenient available networks. And so, and this gets to your first question about Saudi Arabia and ISIS. I actually don't believe, although I wouldn't be shocked if I found out, but I actually don't believe that I've seen compelling evidence that Saudi Arabia is directly financing or supporting ISIS. They actually view them as a profound internal threat because their ideology is so appealing to so many of their own people who've been raised in schools and, and systems which have basically the same uh, you know, kind of religious um, training in many ways. Um, but they see ISIS as a threat for exactly that reason. But what they did do, and, and here the Qataris and the Turks as well, was to create the environment in which a group like ISIS could thrive. By, with a shattered state, with lots of guns, with uh, the extremists always having the upper hand over the moderates, um, they created an a perfect environment for an organization like ISIS to emerge and thrive. I don't think they did it on purpose, but it was the effect, the unintended effect, of many of their decisions to arm and stand up that insurgency in that place at that time. Um, ISIS itself, as you know, you know the, in the proximate way, came out of the Iraqi insurgency. And uh, Iraqi insurgency, which was never fully defeated, um, moved into Syria very early in the conflict, you know, probably May or June of 2011, and set up shop as uh, Jobhar al-Nusra. ISIS emerges as a split out of Jobhar al-Nusra. Um, um, but 
and and then and they fight with each other and uh, and, all, and the rest is uh, you know terrible history. But the um, the broader milieu is the part that actually worries me. It's not just ISIS and Al Nusra. It's Ahr al Sham. It's all of these other jihadist factions which um, have really pulled the opposition very very far from what it once was and uh, from the way it began. And um, I don't think, but I, I don't want to say just blame Saudi Arabia for that because I, what I was really trying to say was that it is a dynamic. Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and Turkey escalate, Iran escalates, Hezbollah escalates, everybody escalates, and nobody up until six weeks ago was willing to say, we've got to stop the fighting. And um, to me, one of the most encouraging signs has been the cessation of hostilities, which hasn't been perfect, but it's already lasted about six and a half weeks longer than anybody thought it would. And it's allowed the re-emergence of civil society, um, dramatic decrease in killing, and uh, hopefully maybe you know, created some space for politics. Um, but you know who's trying to bring down the ceasefire is al-Nusra. Uh, because they understand that uh, cessation of hostilities is very bad for their vision of, 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 this, of this jihad. Um, let's go over to this side. Uh, what's so necessary behind the regional proxy wars? Mm -hmm. Why the competition? It's a good question. Um, and I don't think it's necessary, but it's simply the way that they defined uh, their interests and their self-interest. So, you know, and long before the Arab Spring, the Saudis, the Qataris, and the Emiratis were, were competing with each other in regional forums, but they tended to be um, relatively weak compared to the real power brokers of Arab politics, Egypt, Syria, Iraq. I mean, the big pow militarily powerful states. One by one, those powerful states were removed. Iraq, Syria, Egypt, flat on their backs, unable to play an effective role, and that leaves the field open for countries like, I mean, Saudi Arabia was always a power, but kind of an off-center power. But come on, seriously, Qatar and the UAE? I mean, they could fit in this room. Um, how could they be great powers? But that's the wrong way to think about it. They are great powers in the Middle East now because they're domestically secure, they have enormous wealth, and they've been able to acquire advanced weaponry systems, and they have developed a cadre of well-trained uh, military personnel able to use them. Compared to the rest of the countries in the region, it doesn't matter that they're tiny. They actually do have the instruments of power. Television outlets, vast wealth, domestic stability. And then, this is what great powers do. They compete with each other. The proxy wars then are these new powers in the region competing with each other over whose vision of regional order is going to win out. The, between the UAE and Qatar, the dividing line is primarily Islamism. Uh, the UAE is extraordinarily intensely uh, hostile to the Muslim Brotherhood and Islamist movements, and Qatar has worked with Muslim Brotherhood and Islamist movements. But I tend to think that that's the vehicle rather than the cause. I'm enough of a realist in, in, in this to say that it, this is, to me, this is power politics finding a, finding a way. It's a good question, though. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, thank you very much, sir. We, uh, I'm, I'm really impressed, and thank you for the, your comprehension of the whole issues in the Middle East that you raised. I haven't read the book. I look forward to, to buying and reading it. Um, I'm going to make a couple of statements, and I'd like you to, to respond to that. OK. In the whole conflict, um, you mentioned that Saudi Arabia, um, UAE, and Qatar are doing this and this. Um, don't they have allies in the West? Okay. And also, just going back to the, the fall of the uh, Ottoman Empire, um, first the colonial powers, Great Britain and France, and later on, after World War II, the United, United States have played a major role to cause the havoc that's happened now. Okay. The other uh, question is the refugees. You see, the, it's a, such a tragedy. Now, the European Union is going to spend 10 billion euros, some of it to Turkey. I was wondering what that money would have done, spent in a more compassionate way or to help the region to, to develop and survive. Um, hey, Turkey and, oh. Yugos and uh, um, Saudi Arabia. You, been you, you, said, you said Turkey? Turkey and Saudi Arabia. There have been documented reports that both are supporting ISIS. I was in Turkey in November, and I could see the, the media reporting on that issue, and they were 
uh, arrested and some were killed by, by the Turkish mm -hmm. uh, police. Um, last thing, I appreciate your optimism. How do you see this ending in terms of uh, uh, what kind of solution do you envisage? Say in 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, 40 years, that this thing is going to continue um, until then? Okay, let me um, kind of walk through those in not exactly, well, actually, I'll, I'll just do them in order. So looking at the kind of the role of the Western allies, um, you know, this has been, as I'm sure you know, this has been one of the greatest strains in the alliance, uh, the American-led alliance system uh, since it began, since it really came into shape uh, in 1990, 1991. And I think that, you know, many people blame the Iran deal, they blame American refusal to intervene in Syria, and they say those are the reasons for the crisis between the United States and Saudi Arabia. I actually think that it's Mubarak. I actually think that it was, that's what really drove this, was the, the belief in Saudi Arabia and elsewhere, and for most leaders of the region, that they could no longer trust American security guarantees, and they began pursuing their own path to try and protect their own security, usually making themselves more insecure in the process, in classic realist fashion. And what this ended up, what we ended up seeing, and this is something which is a major argument of my book, is that by this point, I don't even think that you can meaningfully say that the United States has any allies in the Middle East anymore. Um, and what I mean by that is not that we don't have partners. I mean, we're, we've, you know, we've sold something like $30 billion of arms to, uh, to the Gulf. Um, you know, we're, we continue to have a close alliance with Israel and support it and protect it. I, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is, um, allies in the sense of having a shared vision of the region and working together to achieve that region. On almost every major issue of interest to the United States, uh, they've been working, the Gulf states in particular, and Israel have been working at cross purposes, actually trying to frustrate rather than to advance those shared interests. Syria, the Iran deal, democratization, um, and that's, I think, been an enormous problem, which I think is, I think most people, if you ask them in the most leaders of the Gulf, what they'll say, or in Israel, what they'll say is, it's all Obama's fault, and uh, he'll be gone soon, and then everything will go back to normal. And they might even believe it, but I think they're wrong. I think that these problems are structural, and they're going to continue, um, they're going to continue, uh, that divide is going to continue to grow and to expand. So yes, the, these states have backers in the West, but they also, there's real differences now between them in ways that we haven't seen in going on 30 years. Um, in terms of the refugees, this is one of the great issues, I think, of, of our time, to be perfectly honest. Um, and, um, you know, what might that, the money have been better spent? I can't think of anything better to spend money, money on than refugees, to be perfectly honest. I mean, we're talking about millions of people who have been driven from their homes by these wars, who, if they are not, in some sense, rehabilitated into communities, and the kids aren't put in school and given proper health care and educated and put back into secure communities, what do you think the world's going to look like? like with you know, 10 million people who've been driven from their homes and not had proper educations and no healthcare and no nothing but violence, destruction, and war, what do you think that world's gonna look like? I mean, uh, to me, that's a, about just about the worst possible case outcome. I think that the amount of suffering and need among refugee communities uh, should be the great moral issue of, 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 our, of our time, you know, looking at this, but, um, and uh, I, I just don't, I don't even know that it's almost impossible to even begin to comprehend the magnitude of what would be needed to effectively deal with those problems. I'm not just talking about the refugees who've made their way to Europe, and that's what you know, gets most of the attention, or the ones that made their way to Canada. I'm talking about the millions who are languishing in refugee camps in Jordan and Lebanon and Turkey, which I, I'm sure you saw when you were there, um, and you know, no one has a clue about how to meaningfully help them, and because the war is unlikely to end, they're not gonna be able to go home anytime soon, and when they do, there's nothing for them to return to because their communities have been shattered and destroyed. So I, I, I wish I had an answer for you on the refugees, but I look at it as something that we should all be uh, focusing on uh, much more deeply than we have. Um, I don't know how this ends. Um, I, I, I'm not, I, don't, I didn't really think I was giving an optimistic talk, but, um, but I'm happy to try and hold on to some hope. Um, but uh, uh, I'm just going to have to not answer that one because I don't know how to answer it. Um, unfortunately, I wish I did.
and on Turkey. Um, I actually think that the, what has happened in Turkey over the last year or two uh, has been really one of the great political tragedies of, uh, of, 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 that I can remember because Erdogan basically has decided that He's, he's decided to become a classical Arab dictator. He's willing to do anything to stay in power, and that has meant a massive crackdown on civil society, on, on the universities, on the media, um, combined with the reigniting of the war with the Kurds, which had almost been resolved, and now is bringing Turkey back into the dark days of the past. And so I, I see nothing good for what, uh, what uh, Prime Minister, or President Erdogan is now doing to Turkey. Okay, Professor. Thanks so much, uh, Mark. I have a question about uh, maybe lessons for Western or UN Security Council-based interventionism. So I appreciate that you said in Libya, maybe it was a little bit too much, or it became too much, or it changed the dynamics. Um, and there seems to be something of a consensus that in Libya it was too much, in Syria it's far too little, in Iraq it's way, way, way too much. And we kind of want to, I, I mean, I wonder, is there a Goldilocks just right <laughs> lesson from the Arab uh, Spring and interventions there? Or what lessons for interventions on that level can we take um, from Syria, Libya, and so on and so forth? And then secondly, I want to get your thoughts on the peace negotiation process oh, yeah. uh, in Syria. And in particular, um, is there a logical, if you could pick anybody, is there a logical, neutral, uh, dispassionate arbiter that we're somehow missing? Is that part of the problem that because everybody's so heavily and, and, and deeply involved, there is no one to be that logical choice for a mediator? Thanks. No, those are two great questions. Um, each one could be its own lecture. Um, on, on kind of the Goldilocks standard for intervention, I, I, I must admit that um, I, I've become extremely skeptical about any intervention um, because they all fail. Um, and uh, usually what you get is arguments that the, the intervention was good, but the, the aftermath and, the, and you know, the, the post-intervention planning was failed. But to me, that's a dodge because the post-intervention planning is part of the intervention. Uh, when we intervened in Libya, it was very clear we were not going to put in a post-peace, you know, kind of a, a post-intervention peacekeeping force. It was explicitly stated to so then say, oh, but we didn't do that. To me, that's not really fair game. Where I do run into problems, though, as I was trying to say before, is that you're always dealing with counterfactuals, and you just don't know. So let's assume that um, NATO had not intervened in Libya, and I, what I said in my talk 40 minutes ago was if we don't intervene, Gaddafi goes into Benghazi, slaughters a bunch of people, and uh, the, America's blamed for it, and everything is worse. Well, I think that's what would have happened, but I don't know. I can't prove it. Um, I have a whole bunch of evidence that I can bring to bear, but I can't actually prove it. I believe very deeply that in Syria, if the United States had intervened, as many people had hoped, um, it would look just as bad as it does today, except that the United States would be deeply enmeshed in the middle of it. Um, and the same people who are attacking Obama for not intervening, they'd be attacking him for intervening. But I can't prove that. And so that's why I think the arguments about intervention are always so frustrating. Um, and, uh, and, and ultimately irresolvable. On the question of, um, of Syria, the peace talks, no, there's no neutral broker that you're missing. I thought Kofi Annan was the best possible choice for the job. He gave it his all and he failed completely. Um, and I don't think that the, the identity of the broker is really the issue. I think there is a big issue, which uh, you know, I can spend a lot of time talking about, but I won't because I can see people tapping their, uh, their watches which is the type of negotiations. And I, I've been convinced for a while now that it is impossible, I mean literally impossible, to have kind of an inside out kind of negotiation where Syrian opposition sits down with Bashar al-Assad and comes to a deal. I don't believe it's possible. I just don't. For, for one reason, because Bashar's red line is that he stays in power and no opposition leadership could ever accept that. Um, and so what you need then is what I, in stuff I've written, I've called an outside-in kind of approach, where basically the great powers and, and the external patrons all get together, figure out what kind of Syria they want, and then deliver their clients. That's what's happening right now. Uh, can it work? I don't know. But I think it has a better chance than the other way around. Um, you know, if, if, but so anyway, okay, that's enough. Last question. I'll keep it short because it's connected to what uh, you just mentioned, but a lot of people are trying to get their heads around the influence, the impact of Putin now oh, yeah. in this area and wh what his intentions might be and his 
ability to deliver those mm-hmm. intentions and what they mean to the various Arab states now fighting for their, their lives. No, it, it, it's, a, it's a question which you get a lot in the Middle East these days. And I think that there's this, I, I think Putin is opportunistic and he sees the opportunity to act and he takes it. And you saw it in the Ukraine, you see it in Syria. And I think that this is something which has been very difficult for others to respond to. I think that a lot of Arab states who are angry with the United States, they kind of, they flirt with Russia as a way of making America jealous, you know, basically. But I mean, like, like, like Saudi Arabia is really gonna jettison, you know, 30 years of accumulated weapon systems to shift to Russian models. I don't think it's very likely, but it's a way of putting pressure on the United States. So that's why you see even complete depend, completely dependent countries like Jordan uh, meeting with Putin and, like, try, and, and, and showing him um, respect. I, I, I think that you know, Russia is a power to be reckoned with, um, but they're not an alternative hegemon. They're not really an, an alternative alliance partner. What they're doing in Syria is part of that ratcheting game that I was talking about. I mean, people portray the Russian intervention as if it was this great master stroke uh, and, and this strategic genius. What happened was that Assad, or that Russia has exactly one ally in the entire Middle East and it had to use its own military to keep him from being overthrown. And now that they've done it, they can't get out. They're stuck there. And that's basically, to me, they can just barely maintain um, the status quo as opposed to actually transforming the region in their own image. Um, so I'm not saying that we should you know, ignore or dismiss Putin's Russia, but um, I actually don't think that, uh, I, I don't share the analysis that this is some like bold move of strategic genius um, that uh, you know, is changing the region forever. Um, I, I'll have to leave it to my host to decide. Very short question. Okay, okay. I'm you, not the boss. <laughs> you don't mention Israel very much. Could you say that Israel could take a modicum of satisfaction that the Palestinians in the West Bank and the Israeli Arabs didn't use what happened in the Middle East as an excuse to revolt? You know, it's, it's actually extremely interesting. You know, Israel, and I'll, I will keep it short, Israel initially um, saw the Arab uprisings. Um, some people saw it as a real opportunity. I mean, this is actually great. You know, we've wanted to see democratization in the region, and now it's happening. Others were, you know, they saw it in doom and gloom right from the start. You know, nothing good will come of this. The Arab leaders are our friends, and they're being threatened. I mean, Mubarak is their closest ally in the region, and they were doom and gloom from the start. I would say that as things have gone on, the doom and gloom brigade has overwhelmingly won out over the optimistic brigade, which I think is true everywhere. But also in Israel. But the one thing, there's two things distinct to Israel. One is that, uh, there's actually three, I'm sorry. The first is that Israel has never been closer to having open and public diplomatic, uh, an an open alliance with Saudi Arabia than than it has today. I mean, this is one of the really interesting and important strategic changes in the region. Number two, Palestinian issue has dropped way down the list. Palestinian issue used to be the number one concern for Arab public opinion. These days, I doubt it's in the top five. That changes when there's a war. If if Israel bombards Gaza, or if there's a reoccupation of the West Bank, it will immediately shoot back up to the top of the agenda. But the rest of the time, um, and Palestinians feel this extremely keenly, that the Arabs have forgotten them, the Arabs have abandoned them. And um, I think that's something which very much affects how Israel views, you know, this idea that the Palestinians are the central issue in the Middle East has never been, it, it has never been less relevant than it is today. But then the last part, I would not think that Israel should take any great satisfaction from. The fact that the, that the Arab Spring didn't spread to Palestine. Um, there, have been some, there has not been the large scale uprising that many people expected yet, but it seems almost inevitable. Abu Mazen's gonna die at some point. The PA has been on its last legs for years and there is no peace process. And so the idea that the West Bank can be kept in this stasis um, indefinitely, which is what I think m- many Israelis seem to believe, um, I-, I think is not uh, very likely. And so I would actually say that what you have is like this tactical sense of security, which is false, and that uh, we're going to be talking about this again quite soon, is, w- is what I think. So thanks for the question. <laughs> All right, thank you so much for hosting. Thank you. Don't you admire people who, tr- who are able to make sense of the Middle East? <laughs> So thank you, uh, Professor Lynch.
for uh, your valuable insights. My name is Raja Kuram from the Canadian Arab Institute, and uh, we're very thankful for the professor for being with us today and for Professor Momini for making him available to us uh, in, in Toronto, and to our partners at the Bill Grant Center, who together we try to bring speakers who can shed light on this very complex region, likely the most complex in the world, and, uh, and, and uh, the, the, what we're seeing today is the unraveling of states that were drawn with magic markers back at, at the end of the First World War, and, and, uh, and it's going to be long and painful, uh, but it will end at, at some point. So thank you, sir, uh, thank you, sir, and thank you all for being with us.